This episode of the Accounting Insiders podcast is brought to you by Out of the Box Technology. Out of the Box Technology is your partner in accounting data services. With over 7,500 industry migrations performed and an expansive network of third-party integrations, a partnership with Out of the Box will augment your advisory practice and turbocharge client accounting operations. Visit outofthebox.technology.com slash insightful dash accountant to get started. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Accounting Insiders podcast. My name is Gary DeHart. I'm the publisher of Insightful Accountant and Tax Practice News, as well as the host of the Accounting Insiders podcast. And my guest today is uh, John Hewitt, who is no stranger to the tax and accounting uh, world. I think, what'd you just tell me? How long have you been in uh, in this in this space? 54 years. 54. I almost invented it. Um, <laughs> well, on the electronic side, right? Uh, for sure. So, um, well, let me just give a little bit of your background. So 1982, and correct me if I get any of this wrong, but I did pull it out of the bio, but 1982 founded uh, Jackson Hewitt, which grew to roughly 6,000 plus locations across the country, sold that in 1997. And then in 1998, started Liberty Tax. And I want to come back on that, how you did that within a year. That uh, seems, uh, I can't fathom that. And then... Um, 2005 International Franchise Association Entrepreneur of the Year, and Accounting Today, Top 100 Most Influential People's List for, I think it was about a dozen years or so, best-selling author of a book titled I Compete. Love to hear a little bit more about that. And then 1992, listed in Inc.'s fastest growing um, companies, I think it was number two. Is that right? And Inc.'s fastest growing. We were in the Entrepreneur 500 with with two of both of my companies, Liberty and, and Jackson Hewitt. With Jackson Hewitt, we were number two out of 4,000 franchises. And with Liberty, we got to number three. Oh, that's fantastic. Fantastic. So you so you have a little bit of interest in tax and accounting. Now, are you a tax background or an accounting background? Well, I took an H&R Block course in, in when I was a uh, in college at the University of Buffalo. I loved it. And I started working for H&R Block part-time. And so I have extensive tax experience in my early career. And you, as you mentioned, uh, I, for a dozen years in a row by accounting today, I was named as one of the top 100 most influential people in accounting. I love to tease accountants because I've never taken an accounting course. So <laughs> I, I'm zero. I'm good at accounting. I've been CEO of two public companies, right. but I've never taken a course in accounting. Maybe I should have gone that route because I wasn't uh, accounting was not my strongest courses either. So maybe I should have just ignored those and then I uh, wouldn't have had to take them maybe more than one time. But there you go. Yeah. So um, so you took that experience or the time with H&R Block and decided, hey, I think uh, I think there's a bigger opportunity or that that I can work on myself. Is that kind of the what what moved you into Jackson Hewitt into kicking that off? Yeah. The well, first of all, I was with. HR Block for 12 years. Okay. And uh, I was a, a regional director uh, managing 250 locations. My dad, I give my dad all the credit for leaving Block because when I was at University of Buffalo and I was working for Block, my goal was to be an HR Block regional director. And okay. by thir 30, I made it. And so I was at the height of, I was all cocky and this, I met my dreams. And then my dad, he was the CFO of a public company, as I said. He bought one of those first Apple computers by mail way before there was such a thing as an Apple store. Okay. There weren't even 25,000 Apples in the country. And he liked the Apple better than the mainframe that was running his public company. And so my dad gets all the credit. He, he convinced me to leave H&R Block, and he left his public company. And in 1981, we built the first tax software for an Apple computer. Okay. And hmm. I tried to sell it to Block and they kind of laughed it off. In in you know they were they've been a Fortune 500 company for a long long time and in their annual report a couple of years later they said people ask us why we don't computerize. We say why should we? It doesn't save us any money. Our customers don't care. We're never going to computerize. So I was they were so visionary that they were never going to computerize. I and my dad 
bought a little company called Mel Jackson with six stores here in Virginia Beach. And we introduced the computer. And we, as a result, we built a $500 million company. It's a billion, became a billion dollar company and uh, grew a lot faster than H&R Block did because we, we just seized the, seized computerization as the future. Hmm. That's fantastic. So how did you go, how did you sell in 97 and then start a new one in 98? Was there not a non-compete or anything like that in place or how'd that work? Yeah, out? I was, I was a, a little bit uh, clever, if you will. Uh, okay. it, um, Jackson Hewitt's in all 50 states. And so I couldn't go anywhere with their, where there was a Jackson Hewitt office. But remember, I grew up in Buffalo and uh, I knew the I knew the Canadian tax system, and I knew how well H and R Block did in Canada, and there were no Jackson Hewitts in Canada, so we opened Liberty Tax in Canada, okay. and and just as I had in the U S, we built one of the top one hundred retail franchise chains in Canada within three years. Wow. Now what? Um, so obviously you're you've got a a a bend towards sales. I mean, sales has got to be a core of that, right? And what it, what's the driver? I mean, was it number one? Do you think it was sales of hey, we we see an opportunity, we are we understand the business. Now we just have to put together a sales and marketing package and go out and make it happen. And I mean, is that just how how do you do that? So the the I'm not sure if you're asking me what our goal was or how I did it. Probably Which, or how you did it. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the thing that to build one billion dollar company that has 6,000 locations, let alone two companies, two public companies from scratch that were worth, that are the two of the largest 100 chains in the country. First of all, you got to be blessed. But, but secondly, you have to have something going for you. My biggest blessing is that I, in thinking back over the years, and, and I talk about this a little bit in my book, but um, the, is I will always want to do what's best for every person. And whether it's a customer, whether it's an employee, whether it's a stockholder, whether it's a franchisee, my goal is always to do what's best for that person. And I've only lost about, in my whole career, four or five really great employees that I wish I had kept. But each and every time if they said, you know, I want to go over and over to the, be, I don't want to be, do this anymore. I want to go be a pilot or I want to go, uh, go to get my MBA or, or I want to go work for very, none of them went to work for competitors, but um, in each and every case, I always want what's best with. And if you start doing what's best for people, you can't go wrong, right? You can't, you can't out give, uh, I, the more you give, the more you receive. So it's the number one key to my success in my belief is I always want to do what's best for every person. And that, um, so then as you moved into Canada, thinking about, all right, what's best for every person was the, the approach that you took more of a, um, was it a really shotgun approach of let's just get the word out to as many people as we can, or was it a real strategic, we're going to go to Toronto or you know, whatever the market was and yeah. you know, establish five franchises here and then build out from there. How's that, what's that look like? I learned that lesson back in the United States. When we started franchising Jackson Hewitt in 1985, we were we were only had offices in Virginia Beach market. And so I said, we're going to do this strategically. We're going to go just south of us is Raleigh Durham, just north of us is Richmond. And then we're going to go to Winston Salem. And then we're going to go to DC. Then we're going to go to Charlotte. And then we're going to go to Baltimore. And so I was going to do it very strategically right. like that and thoughtfully. And then what happened is we were approached from people all over the country who were interested in becoming a Jackson Hewitt franchise. So we tested. And what I learned, Gary, is that you can put a person 
in the the first guy in the state of Louisiana, Monroe, Louisiana, in the middle of nowhere, cl close to the Arkansas border. It was the first guy we ever opened, and he was the number one new store out of 150 in the country. The oh, next wow. year, the next year, um, in in Rapid City, South Dakota, first office we ever opened in South Dakota. She was no one had ever heard of us in in South Dakota. Next year, she was the number two in the country. And so what I learned is that you can put a great franchisee anywhere and they will they will succeed. You can put an, a mediocre or poor franchise in the best territory in the country with, with brand name of 80 or 90% and they will fail. So I learned that it wasn't geography specific, it was people specific. So what I've done is find the right people. And, and you mentioned me as a salesman. I'm really not a salesman. And at the end of the day, what I teach, and I brought in over 5,000 franchisees, what I teach is find the right person. Because you don't try to sell someone that this isn't right for, right? Yeah. You have to find someone that's the right time in their life. They're meant to be self-employed. This is the right industry. And then we will present the opportunity to them and that's the only kind of people you want because someone that you have to sell is, and, and there are people that can sell sand to the Arabs and ice to the Eskimos. There are people, like great salespeople like that, but that's not me. I can only do what's right for you. So mm -hmm. I have to find the right person and present them the opportunity. Did the, um, what typically is and, and we'll stick in tax and accounting just for now and then we'll talk about a little bit more about the, your current business because it has it's like multiple it's a right. lot of different tracks right within that yep. current Ten different brands yep. yeah so in that tax and accounting side is there a in, in your history is it more were the franchises that you sold under both brands were they more to people who were already in tax and accounting who needed the back-end resources to, to be able to grow and expand their current business? Or was it somebody who was, you know, well, I was going to say Joe Dog Walker, but I don't think we had dog walkers when you started it, but, um, or was it somebody from outside the profession, typically? Yeah, the about 50% of the 5,000 people I brought into tax yeah. knew something about tax. They were accountants, or they had worked for h &R Block or Jackson Hewitt or Liberty. So 50% um, had some tax experience. 50% came from all walks of life. They just fell in love with the, the great characteristics about the income tax industry. It's death and taxes. It's certain. It's recession proof. Right. right? It's seasonal. And um, a lot of people like the fact they only have to work hard for four months and they get a lot of vacation time. So there's a lot of great things about taxes that appeal to people that had never been in the industry before. It was interesting. I was at uh, one of the IRS nationwide forums, the one in DC, probably three or four years ago, and was on an escalator with the lady. And, and I asked her, like, so, you know, what's your business like? You know, what do you do outside of tax season? She's like, I don't do anything outside of tax season. It's like, I work I worked my tail off from, you know, whatever the dates were, January through May. And after that, I enjoy, I enjoy my, the fruits of my labor, which that's very attractive, right? That's, that's a lot to be said. Actually, yeah. A lot of people like that. And, and uh, you know, about two thirds of our franchisees that I brought in are like that. One third do other things. Now do insurance or accounting or financial planning or some other occupation to make it to have a full year round job. But if you can make all the, if you pick a number and that's gonna make you happy, whether it's 50,000 a year or a million dollars a year, whatever, if you're making that money and only working hard for four months, that's a great quality of life. Right, absolutely. So that's one more question on tax and accounting and then we're gonna bounce over to what you're doing now. Then I do wanna hear a little bit about the book too. Um, so tax and accounting, what do you see in, I mean, obviously, like you just said, I mean, it's a uh, tax, you know, death and taxes. So it, it's going to be with us. How much has it changed though with, and again, I'm not, I'm not a, a tax accountant, but how much has that 
business changed with just changing regulations and rules from the IRS um, over the past you know few years? And and what does that look like moving forward? Yeah, the the biggest change obviously over the last. Uh, 25 years is the internet and online filing, right? And when I, to put it in into numbers, when I started in 1969 preparing taxes, only 25% of the people prepared their their uh, own rate, I'm sorry, went to, a, went to a tax preparer. 75% of the people did their own return. And that rose about 1% a year for uh, 36 years until, or, or 26 years, that um, they, more and more people um, began to do go to a tax preparer. And so it peaked in 2005 at 60% of the people pay to prepare and 40% did their own. Well, about that time, uh, the internet was beginning to go crazy and people were beginning to file online. And, but it wasn't the people who were going into a prepare. It was the people that were doing their own return by pencil and paper. Okay. And so um, today, 28 years later, or I'm sorry, 18 years later, the about 60% of people pay a prepare. And the other 40% do it on, online. Back then, uh, back in early 2000, all the people, virtually all the people did it by paper and pencil. Today they do it online. And so it's it's mostly had an impact in uh, stopping the growth of more and more people going to prepare, paying up prepare. But people still seek a prepare for competence. People are afraid of the IRS. You know, right. I, I feel like sending them a thank you card at least every week, if right. not every day. They send them a letter. They audit them. They you hear the you hear they put people in jail. They find them. You hear all these horror stories that it seems like, if not true, the IRS has more power than any other agency, and that scares people. In my career, I've had tens of thousands of people say to me, "I'm afraid of the IRS." Not one person's ever said to me, I'm afraid of the FBI or right. I'm afraid of the CIA. So that fear drives people to, to come and get a prepare. They want someone to sign the return and be between them and the IRS. And, yeah. and that that's created a, a lifelong career for me. That's fantastic. And so you took that, took kind of the franchise mentality and now you're now you said there's ten brands under the the or is that you call it a brand under loyalty brands? Exactly. Okay. And uh, so and when I was looking on the on the site earlier, it's a pretty diverse group of, of products. How did you end up going from you know we're highly focused in tax and accounting to this kind of a, a basket of brands under the loyalty umbrella? Well, it was sort of by accident. Because as you pointed out, when I left Jackson Hewitt, I had a non-compete. When I left Liberty Tax, I had a non-compete. And during my non-compete period, um, I was having a um, dinner with an attorney that had worked for me both at Jackson Hewitt and at Liberty. Yeah. And he was a franchise specialist. And he said, well, you're not in taxes right now. Why don't you get out of the tax business? He said, I have this business broker that they're making tons of money hand over foot. They've got great system, but they can't bring in new franchisees. They've been in business for 13 years and they only have 15 franchisees. Mm -hmm. Why don't you go to companies like that and partner with them and merge with them and you can be the sales arm and the mentor arm. And so I began with them acquiring uh, part ownership in a, a number of organizations where we brought in mentoring and and our franchise sales ability. And I, I'm so blessed that I've developed every major city in this country of more than 30,000 people in both Jackson Hewitt and Liberty. And so I have a huge, great reputation in every 
area of the country you name. If you want, if you want to open something in Jackson, a franchise, whether it's a business broker or uh, the uh, little medical school or roofing company, and you want to go to Jacksonville, Florida, I have people there that have worked for me. That uh, that my five thousand franchisees said over a hundred thousand employees. I have people that know of me, so it's it's. I thought it'd be a lot easier to build these businesses up with my name, reputation, and my credibility all over the country. Yeah, because then then it comes to you know people trusting you and what you've done and your experience, right? And 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 obviously people. And, well, I don't say obviously. So really, more of a question. So do you find that, all right, so you've got these 10 brands that you're out selling now, how many of those end up, people who are buying into those brands are people who have purchased from you previously, like in Jackson Hewitt or- It's, or it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good percentage. It's, yeah. almost, it's almost half. And when I say people that have, um, it, it's, it's half if you count parents that are investing for their children. For example, we have in our Zoom and Grooming franchise, our mobile grooming, two of my franchisees from uh, Liberty to my master franchisees, they have each have their a previous marriage. They have a, a 19 year old from their previous marriage. Yeah. And one's a boy and one's a girl. And they bought a master franchise for north of Detroit and they bought a one unit, one mobile van for their children. So they are, they're not the franchisee. The 19-year-old children are franchisees. So if you include brothers and sisters and, and children and occasionally a parent that, or a friend, then it's 50% of the new franchisees coming in are related to knowing me from past life. That's great. And then is that, um, do you run back to them in a, or you run back across them? Are you going into these, you know, the major metropolitan areas or the, or the target areas and, and setting up a, uh, a, you know, a two-day conference on, hey, here's everything that, you know, that loyalty brands has under the umbrella, come take a look. Or is it a lot of outbound, hey, remember me? It's, it's a lot of email and uh, written information sent out. But when I go to a city and I travel all the time, I'm in two or three cities a week, I have lunches, breakfasts, and dinners. I mean, even yesterday I had Sunday, I had a breakfast in Virginia Beach and then I had uh, two, two later breakfasts in Williamsburg, which is about an hour drive. So yeah. wherever I go, I, I either meet with prospective or uh, previous franchisees or current franchisees are all of the mixture of all of them. And, and, and it's it's great fun to see. I, I feel really good about the, wherever I go, there's quality people that I get to meet with, whether it's people that were with me before are with me now or perspective. So it's just, it's just humbling. Right. Is that, um, what would you say are the, the top, maybe I don't even know if there's five, but like, what would you say the five, top five characteristics are of a successful franchisee? It's really easy because it's only one. Okay, even better. So there's one. It's only like one. Really it's from, one. Uh, from that movie. I can't remember the movie. Uh, play, uh, not uh, The one with... Uh, Pay it forward? No. no, where he was like, it's just one uh, secret of life kind of thing. It's uh, not Ray Kroc and, and the McDonald's story. No, they wrote, uh, they, were, they were doing like a dude ranch, roping cattle, Billy Crystal. Mm. I can't remember the any anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so the one, what's what's the one key characteristic? My job as a franchisor is to give the franchisee the best system in the industry. I've been doing that for 54 years. When I was at Block, we had the best system, fastest growing. When I was at Jackson Hewitt, best system, fastest growing. When I was at Liberty. Best system, fastest growing. And now, loyalty brands, best system, fastest growing. If I do my job, your job is to follow that recipe, not to invent. Now, you would think, Gary, that that would be simple. That I've been doing this for 54 years. 
I founded a billion dollar company. I founded two companies that have 10,000 offices, two public companies. You, and I'm old, right? I'm 74 years old. I, I'm very experienced. And mo the average age of people coming in is half my age, less yeah. than 37. You would think there'd be automatic. But out of the 5,000 franchisees I brought in, guess how many have listened 100%? <laughs> yeah, 0.0. .0. Zippity doodah. Zippity <laughs> doodah. Nobody, nada. It's amazing. It's not amazing because it's human nature. Exactly. I mean, initially, initially, I was a little amazed. And, but I learned it's just human nature. Human beings aren't good at listening. And right. so, so I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how experienced you are. I don't care if you ever even have a high school diploma. What I care about is when I outline on January 22nd, this is what you need to do. This is what time to open your office. This is how to advertise. This is how much you charge for return. This is how you hire the preparer and train the preparer. If I, I'm going to give you exactly what you need to do. Now, my, you'll see if in my book, for example, when I published it eight years ago, we had already created 800 millionaires. The millionaires list in 98% plus. But I've also had a thousand people that went out of business. Mm -hmm. They failed. And they list in less than 90%. So there's only one thing that matters. It doesn't matter what city you're in because we won't let you go to the wrong city. Right, we won't let you to go go to the wrong location, right. and we won't let you not know how to do it. When you don't follow the system and aren't succeeding, we we email you, then we call you, and then we come and talk to you and say, "Gary, you're not listening. You need to change, or you're going to fail." Right. So I don't feel I don't in a way I don't feel bad that they fail because they are not if. We are obnoxious in telling you, you're not doing, you're not following the recipe. If if you bought, uh, I mean, I don't cook anything, but if I was going to try to cook something and bake the greatest cake ever, and I got a recipe from the greatest chef ever, the baker ever, and it's said to put in a quarter pound of sugar, why would I put in a third of a pound? Right. Or an eighth. Of, that's just crazy. Right. So it's only one thing. It's that it's that important. You must follow the recipe. That's my job. I've done it well for 54 years. Your job is to follow the recipe. Is the. Um, when you're when you're meeting with people and, and going through that process, can you on the front end decide this person's going to listen, that person's not going to listen or do you have, a? I mean, I imagine after that many years, you've got a gut feeling for who will and who won't. Well, you know what? I'm not, I'm not an expert at it because every, everyone says they're going to listen, even though I tell them no one ever has, right? Right. And oh, I'll be the first one. Yeah. Out of the, out of the 5,000 I brought in, at least 500 told me, I'm going to be the first person to ever listen. I'm going to surprise you. I'm going to be, I'm going to be the first person. So yeah. some people even get cocky and say, I'm going to listen. No one dares tell me they're not going to listen. Right. Because if you tell me that, then I'm not going to sell you a franchise. Because I get to pick you and you get to pick me. But I've been surprised over the years, even with bringing in 5,000 people. I've sometimes people surprise me favorite, And sometimes they surprise me negative. But at any point in the process, if you're not following the system, we say, you know what? This isn't right for you. This isn't right for you. You need to, you need to, here's your money back. Go away. Um, God bless you. You're not going to listen. You're not going to succeed. So there's many people in the process. We turn away and, and say, you know what? You're not going to listen. So you need to go do it. You're, you need to go find somewhere else to be extraordinary because it's not going to be here. Right. Okay. Uh, one more question around franchising. Then I want to talk about your book or have you tell me about the book? Cause I haven't had a chance to read it. Um, and that is like, you know, interest rates, what, 7%. I don't know if they are today, seven, 8%. Um, 
it does that impact your business directly kind of the the franchise sales side because i've never looked into how franchises get financed so um how, it's, how does that impact you it's it's um no no significant impact okay. at all okay and then uh so on the book and again last two things i do want to touch on is your book and then your podcast and that uh, it seems like they're probably fairly intertwined so uh, well, we might kill two birds with one stone on this one. So awesome. I compete is the name of it, right? I compete. And mm -hmm. um, what kind of what was the the thought in writing it? And then and and what are you what are you tackling with that? Yeah, the, the thing the thing that that um, drives me is changing people's lives, and that's driven me for m my whole life, and. Um, I am a, a compulsive at trying to change people's life. And sometimes, <coughs> sometimes I can be obnoxious about it. If I met you in, and you were in business and didn't even ask my opinion, and I might tell you, well, maybe you should do it this way. I, right. you know, so I can be obnoxious about it. But the book um, is, what I do in the book is I talk about my mistakes and how I learn from my mistakes. Right. What I've learned is the more successful you are, that just means you made more mistakes than anyone, right? I've made, in, in my industry, in tax, I'm the great granddaddy of tax. I've made every mistake that can be made or and or seen every mistake that's made. So in the book, one of the, 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 the only, I think, unique thing about the book is that I talk a lot about what I learned from my mistakes. Okay. I, I acknowledge mistakes. And so people that read the book say, I like it when you tell that story about what happened and how it affected you and how you changed. But there's a lot, it's just the story of my career from, for example, this is a, I, I talk about when I was, the first entrepreneurial venture was I was four years old. Okay. And I got, a, I lived in Rochester, New York and received a sled for Christmas. And because back then there was snow on the ground all winter long. And I took it to the next door neighbor and sold it for 10 cents on Christmas morning. Now, that was my first entrepreneurial venture. Now, the good news is it only cost $4 to my parents. <laughs> and the better news is they gave it back to me. But I, so it was just a mistake that I learned from, right? Exactly, right, yeah. That um, we have this little girl two doors over. I think she's in second grade. It is amazing. It's like she came knocking. Uh, we see her probably twice, a, twice every couple of weeks. She'll come over with some venture. She's like, "Hey, you know, I can write a poem for you, or I can walk your dog, or I mean, it's just she constantly." And she yesterday or day before knocked on the door, and she's like, "Hey, I'm here to sing Christmas carols," and she's like, "It doesn't cost anything. This is free." I just want to sing for you. And we're like, all right, that's fantastic. But, uh, and, and my wife's like, well, you're, I mean, you are certainly an entrepreneur. She's like, I don't know what that means. And they explained it to her. She's like, yeah, I like doing things like that. And so she's only seven or eight years old. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Watch, watch for her 20 years from now. Absolutely. I mean, it's right. amazing. She's just very driven and, and right. she'll, and she'll do anything. It's so funny. Right. She's like, yeah, I can do that. Sure. I awesome. uh, love seeing that. Absolutely. And so uh, your podcast, how long have you, uh, have, how long have you had the podcast? I, I um, have stopped doing my own podcast. Okay. And so I'm, I'm on podcasts like yours about, okay. I make myself available. So, and I have extensive experience, as I said, I'm a granddaddy and I'm a real life granddaddy. I have my third one in June and my fourth one's in great grandfather. Okay. And I, feel old until I became a great grandfather. When I turned 70, that didn't feel old. But when I heard the phrase great grandfather, right. almost no one got to meet their great grandparents, right? So that makes me feel old. But now I have three and one on the way in, in February. So um, I, I really have just made myself available as a guest. I don't have time to do my own anymore and prepare. Yeah. And so forth. But I'm, but I, my goal, my number one goal when I wake up and is to improve the world and make it a better place 
and to give back. I believe who much is given, much is required. And so, so I do podcasts now for others, but I don't, I gave up my own show. I got you. Okay. I'm going to wrap up with one more question. We're going back to loyalty brands and it's loyaltybrands.com. I think was the, was where all that sits. Um, yeah. Of those 10 franchises, um, maybe what are the top two fastest growing two or three? Uh, or you can shout them all out as far as I care. Right. But you, you, you said the right number. It's, it's, and it's the, the old 80, 20 rule, right? Yeah. That, that 20%, uh, is typically we have two brands that are growing rapidly and the other eight are not and the two are tax of course because i've been in tax for 54 years and as i i'm the self-proclaimed great granddaddy of tax now there's I'm, i didn't win any award but i proclaim myself as the right <laughs> but zoom and grooming mobile grooming is going crazy Oh, I just, I've only learned the pet industry in the last less than three years, but it's pet industry is phenomenal. And so we're looking at branching out and offering other services in our, with our grooming, because out of our tens of thousands of, of mobile grooming customers, some of them need dog walking. Some mm -hmm. of them need pet sitting. Some yeah. of them need daycare. So we're looking at expanding into the pet industry. So the number one brand in growth surprises me because I was fastest growing in tax forever is the, the mobile grooming. That's interesting. Yeah. And pet sitting is a big deal, right? I mean, we, um, you know, we have a dog and, you know, put them in the vet, it's good minimum $35 a day if you're lucky um you know, we had a lady who would come stay at the house and when we first started using her she was 20 bucks a day we're like wow that's a bargain and then i think she had several other people tell her how much of a good deal it is now she's up to you know 35 dollars a day but she stays at the house dog goes out and you know and it's it's fine it's easy um right. and it's a lot easier than dropping them off with a lot of other pets right it's, especially now the there's just stuff. this there's just this new disease right Yes. There's yeah. a new, it's a COVID of pets, right? Whatever. Yeah. yeah. And it's bad news. I, I read about that last week. So that uh, so that's exciting. That sounds like a, a, a major, and I think there's a definite correlation with the dog or the pet side and the aging population. I remember my brother was talking about that somewhat recently about how the pet industry was, this probably two or three years ago, we were just saying the pet industry was booming and there's a, a tight correlation there with the aging population, people having pets and having to deal with them. So that's great. Sounds like a good place to be. Plus, hey, who doesn't love uh, who doesn't love pets? I know there's a small percentage of people who don't, but uh, you got to love pets. Uh, you know, there was just a great survey that a few months ago, they, they asked parents who had children and pets, what do you like better? And two thirds of them like the pet better than their child <laughs> or children. Yeah, that's really funny. I'll uh, make sure I'll tell my kids that when they come home. They're both in college, so we're, uh, we'll see them in about three or four days. I think one of them one of them gets out Wednesday, one of them gets out Thursday. So awesome, yeah. So well, thank you, John. I certainly appreciate your time. Um, love to kind of catch back up with you over time and just have a similar conversation, or even maybe we could dive a little bit deeper into actual franchising. So if because we reach so our our site. Just our newsletter. I won't talk about the website stats because newsletters are people we know. We have about 10,000 subscribers to Insightful Account. It goes out daily. We have another 7,500 subscribers to Tax Practice News. It goes out twice a week. Uh, between those two lists, it's about 15,000 unique people. And, you know, the large majority, I can't say 100%, large majority are in tax and accounting. Uh, for Insightful Account, it heavily focused in the QuickBooks Pro Advisor space. Um, we started Tax Practice News really as a product for kind of what I would call the, the IRS forum attendee, because that group really seemed to be a, a group of people that didn't have a, a central resource of, of information um, at their disposal. So we really started that for them, but love to talk to you a little bit more about what that franchise world looks like for people who, uh, who we have you know, influence over and not, I don't want to say influence over people who we reach on a regular basis. So.
love love to uh, give people insight on that. Most people are against franchising and they don't understand the benefits. So that that could be extensive um, experience for them to to learn about that. Yeah, I, I think it's more you go in thinking, well, it's just going to cost me money and not right. understanding what that back end, all the back end support or the, even the front end, right, of, of having somebody in your ear saying, you have to do this on February 15th, you have to do this on January the 22nd or whatever it is, you have to, you know, McDonald's, we mentioned that earlier, you know, you have to put the pickles this way and this much mustard, this much ketchup, this many exactly. onions. So exactly. plus, Consist please, consistency is very important. Right. And it matters. So we'll certainly appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It was nice to meet you. Maybe if you're ever in the Atlanta area, let me know. Let's grab a breakfast, lunch or, or dinner. Definitely do that. Thank you, Gary. Have a great day. Yeah. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. This episode of the Accounting Insiders podcast is brought to you in part by Zero. Zero is a powerful cloud accounting software that improves efficiencies across your practice. With all client data stored on a single unified ledger, you and your clients can easily access and collaborate on the same set of books. Zero's advisor tools and automation solutions reduce time-consuming manual tasks and put data entry on autopilot. Work faster and more efficiently than ever before with Zero. Visit zero.com/accountinginsiders to learn more.